Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome you to this worship service on this Lord's Day. It is Palm Sunday. It's good to see all of you here. We've got a bunch of people scattered right now because all the youth, all the kids, uh, we still have some Sunday school folks uh, in classes, and I think it's just going to take a little while to learn where we're supposed to be and, and all of that. Um, a couple of announcements to make um, about, about today. First of all, uh, I hope you all uh, really uh, like the new uh, setup in here. I think it looks uh, so much uh, more worshipful and it really transforms the space. There's a lot of people who worked hard this weekend uh, on everything from painting to arranging and uh, of course, even getting up here and uh, changing the, uh, putting the new uh, projectors in, which was no easy task either. So we are thankful for all the help that we got this week. Um, also, um, this week is a, a really important week today. Of course, Palm Sunday kicks off Holy Week. Wednesday, we will have regular Wednesday programming. We will have... Um, uh, the Bible study for adults, we'll have the journey for youth, and we'll have the big picture for children, and we'll have a uh, supper as well, and you don't want to miss the supper, it's fried chicken this week, macaroni and cheese, green beans, and all that, so very good supper, and then on Thursday night, we'll have uh, Monday Thursday worship, we'll naturally do uh, the observance of the Lord's Supper, uh, but we'll also add this year uh, the right of foot washing. Now, don't let that scare you away. Um, if, if I haven't talked to you before now, don't worry about it. I'm not going to call folks randomly out of the congregation. This will be a, a, a thing that we've invited people to be a part of uh, prior to it. So come with no fear uh, of that service. And then on Good Friday, the sanctuary will be open and there will be some stations of the cross on the walls. And, and a devotional material will be handed out so you can go around and spend some time uh, in, in prayer and devotion, thinking about Jesus' death for our sakes on the cross. Then on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, we'll have the sunrise service out in the field, and that'll be at 8 o'clock, and there's a ball. And I wish I could put that good. Um, and then we'll have some uh, light breakfast items in here and fellowship time. And then 11.30, uh, well, we'll have 10, uh, 9.30 traditional worship, 10.30 Sunday school. And the children will go to uh, Easter egg hunt during Sunday school. And then we'll have the 11.30 service here, a uh, message in the gym. So I hope you'll bring somebody with you Sunday to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. I think... That is all of the announcements, and I'm going to go back here and lead our call to worship uh, from the back because the children and everyone is going to we're going to have a poem procession this morning. So let me go right back here. All right, guys, we're ready. So if you would, uh, if you would, if you all would stand with me for our call to worship. And read responsibly. And they waved palm branches and shouted at Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our opening song is a song that reminds us of the cross. It's called Down at the Cross. It's an old song. Down at the Cross, glory to his name. Join us as we sing.
Today, we are certain that our redemption will come through earthly means. Restore us on Sunday when we are startled by the rollaway stone and all by your rising from the dead. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen.
do a good job. Any other kiddos? Awesome. Well, good morning again, friends. Good morning. Good morning. We've been together a lot already. We're a little tired. Awesome. Well, today is a special day, and we did something kind of funny to start church today. What did we do? Palm Sunday. We did, it is Palm Sunday, and we waved what? Palms. Why did we wave
So, as some of you already know, uh, Jeff and I are leading this uh, amazing youth group and they're more involved in it right now, but going through confirmation, if you're unfamiliar with what confirmation is, it's simply a study of the basics of the Christian faith. It's uh, sort of Christianity 101, it's a concentrated time of, of teaching and hopefully learning the primary doctrines of the Christian faith. And the end of it, of course, happens on Confirmation Day, and that, by the way, will be May the 7th, and it'll be a single service on that day, and it'll be out in the, out in the field out here. We're going to do it out here, and we're going to have a, a big lunch to follow. It'll be a great celebration, and it'll be a wonderful opportunity to bear witness to uh, the Lord and, and our faith, having it outside on Main Street. But these at that service, these young people will, will declare with certainty that they believe, that they have faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ, and that they are his followers and that they are prepared uh, and preparing for a life of faith, a life of holiness, and 
and holy living that will take them through this life all the way to the life to come in heaven with Jesus. During our times together, these confirmation times, we get a lot of, uh, let's just say, odd questions sometimes, like this one. Were there Bigfoots on Noah's Ark? And, and by the way, I'm assuming that Bigfoots is the plural and not big feet, because that would just sound rather really strange. Um, here's another one. What, exactly what kind of fish swallowed Jonah? Here's another one. Um, why did the Israelites make a golden calf to worship? Couldn't they have come up with something better to worship than a cow? My absolute favorite, though, in really in 30 years of, of teaching confirmation, I have never gotten a better question than this, um, or at least a, a funnier question than this. Are you ready? Here it is. If you die and go to hell but don't like it, um, can you just leave? <laughs> now, it's easy to laugh at, at those questions, but I would suggest to you uh, that the questions our young people ask, even the strange ones, are actually showing us that they're reading the Bible, which, I, which we're, we're happy about, that they're thinking through their faith, that they're taking this stuff seriously, and they ask some serious questions, too, like this one. What was the source of light before God made the sun? Now, I don't want you to do this while I'm preaching, but at some point today, I want you to go and read Genesis chapter 1. Because if you do, you'll discover that God said, let there be light on the first day of creation. But he didn't make the sun until the fourth day of creation. So they have a good question. What's the source of light for the first three days? Um, here's another question. On what day did God make dinosaurs? And what about unicorns? When did he make unicorns? And were unicorns on Noah's Ark? Now, before you dismiss that question, I want you again to take your Bible later, King James Version specifically, and read Job 39, 9 and 10. Now, those questions are signed. The one that really stuck with me and really inspired this sermon today is this one. Why did people hate Jesus so much? He was so good and so kind and so loving. Why did they hate him so much that they turn on him and kill him? The answer, I think, is actually in our gospel lesson, or at least it begins with our gospel lesson, and it's from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. So if you're able, would you stand for a reading from the gospel? Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came near Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks um, on the road, and others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. The crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. You may be seated and let's pray. Heavenly Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, kindly make us for your Son's sake. Amen. So the confirmation question was this Why did they hate Jesus so much? So much that they turn on him and want him dead. And actually kill him. Well, to be honest, the answer is a little bit more simple than we, we might imagine. The reason they hated Jesus so much 
was because they thought he was a complete and total failure. He was a letdown. He was a dud. He was a disappointment. They thought he was this, and he turned out to be that. They wanted him to do what they wanted him to do, but Jesus came to do what God wanted him to do. They wanted him to conform to their image of what the Messiah should be, but he showed them that the true Messiah demanded that they conform to his image. Before I get too far ahead of myself, let's take a look at, at what this is all about. Long before Jesus was born, the Jews had been waiting for the Messiah to come. We are familiar with that. They, they believed that this Messiah would be a great and powerful Savior, a, a righteous, wise, and just man who would conquer all their enemies and protect them and provide for them and make their lives happy and peaceful and prosperous. 600 years before Jesus, for instance, God made this promise through the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, and deal wisely, and execute justice and righteousness in the land. For generations, the Jews believed that there would come a day when they would no longer be the people that everybody else in the world mistreated and, and looked down on and abused. Instead, one day, when the Messiah came, this Messiah who would be a descendant of their greatest king, David, which, by the way, is why they called him Meshach ben David, which is what they still say in, in Israel now, Messiah, son of David. But that one day when the Messiah came, Things would be different. He would be a great military leader. He would defeat and overthrow every government and every person who opposed them. He would be a great political leader. And he would rule, as I said, with justice and wisdom and equity. He'd be a charismatic leader. Somebody who inspired people. Someone they would gladly follow anywhere and imitate in their lives. He would be a great teacher of Jewish law that they would look up to and keep all the commandments. That's not all. The Messiah would make Jerusalem quite literally the center of the world, and he would rule from there as Lord and King. Zechariah prophesied that. And the Lord will be king from there over all the earth. His kingdom would be glorious. It would be free from sin. It would be free from wickedness, free from harm of any kind. Isaiah foretold this. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for the people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations. Neither shall they learn war anymore. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the little calf together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra. And the wean child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what the Jews were expecting. That's what they were waiting for on that first Palm Sunday. That's who they thought had come to town, who had arrived, their great deliverer, their long-expected rescuer, their all-conquering king, this larger-than-life hero who had swat Pontius Pilate like a fly, who would squash Herod like a bug, who would topple Caesar like a pile of sticks. Now, you might think, it, it might be easy to think this, that the fact that Jesus rode into town that day on a donkey would have signaled to them, well, maybe this ain't the guy you think he is. But actually, that little donkey was no big deal to them. In fact, they expected the donkey. It was prophesied. Way back in Genesis uh, chapter 49, this was foretold about the coming Messiah. 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah. That is, again, a reference to the line of David. Nor shall the ruler's staff from between his banners until Shiloh come. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. He ties his donkey's fold to the vine and the donkey's coat to the vine's branches. Now you might be saying, okay, I see the connection to the donkey, but what in the world is Shiloh? Who is Shiloh? What is Shiloh? Well, Shiloh is a, is a derivative of an old Hebrew word that simply means the one to whom it belongs. In other words, the kingdom of the line of Judah, the kingdom of David, belongs to the Messiah, the ultimate, and all victorious Redeemer King yet to come. On this day, it's first Paul Sunday, they thought it had come at last. They had such great expectations, such high hopes. Jesus, their Messiah, had come. And he had come to take care of business, which would begin by overthrowing Rome. So imagine this scene. Jesus slowly enters the city, and there are tons of people jamming the streets. They're saying to one another, it's the Messiah. He's finally here. Then, with the words of the prophet Zechariah ringing in their ears, they began to celebrate, really. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Sing aloud, daughter Jerusalem. Behold, your king will come to you. He is righteous and victorious, but he is humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the offspring of the donkey. So naturally, they started cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. They started taking off their outer robes and throwing them on the ground. They grabbed palm fronds and tree branches and began waving them in the air. And they took blankets and they laid them on the road for the donkey to walk on in order to make a carpet for its feet. Their cries grew louder, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Their day of freedom, of liberation, of salvation had finally come. By this point, the crowd had worked themselves into a frenzy. They were just thrilled beyond words at what was about to happen. But what actually happened sucked all the air out of their balloons as Jesus got down off the donkey. A hush fell over the crowd. What was he going to say? What was he going to do? What would his first pronouncement be? Would he tell us when or where or how he was going to take charge? Would he call down fire from heaven and level all the enemies of God's people? Would he, would he command an army of angels from heaven to come and follow him into battle? No. There was none of that. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus simply got off that donkey and walked into the temple. And according to Luke's gospel, he wept. He broke down and cried. And then according to Mark's gospel, by the time that was over, it was really too late to do anything else. So Jesus and the disciples just left. After all that hoopla, he up and left. What just happened, they all wondered. They, they were stunned. What a dud. They probably said, what a phony. Here we are expecting this great and mighty Messiah to save us. And then all this guy did was cry and walk away. He let us down. So the crowd began to leave one by one, quietly at first, of course. But then there was a murmur that began, as murmurs often do. And as the murmuring continued, they grew angrier and angrier and angrier. By the next morning, that anger had morphed into violence, and they were ready. He had let them down so much. He had failed them so greatly. They wanted his head on a platter. They wanted this man to pay for building them up and then not living up to the expectations. They wanted to get back at him. They wanted to destroy him. By the way, even though that was 2,000 years ago, people are no different today. Ask any football, baseball, basketball coach, or any person who's ever been president of the United States, or anyone who's ever been a pastor of a church, 
They'll tell you that when you first arrive, everybody loves you. They believe that you are the, the, the great leader they've been waiting for, the one who will finally put this football program back in the top ten, or uh, the one who will fix the broken economy, or restore America's place in the world, or the one who will turn the church around and have revival. But in time, when you don't do things, or say things, or advocate for things that the fans, the electorate, or, or the congregation wants. If you don't live up to their expectations, they'll treat you worse than an enemy on the battlefield. That's exactly the way it was with Jesus. He went from being their anticipated redeemer king to public enemy number one. Just a matter, if you think about it, in a matter of hours. So that by Good Friday, just five days later, those who were crying out to him, save us, were now shouting to the top of their lungs, crucify him, kill him. See, the truth is, he was not a dud, a, a, a phony that they accused him of being. In fact, Jesus was everything that God promised the Messiah would be. He was not the wrong Messiah. Instead, the people were just wrong about him. Just like so many people continue to be wrong about Jesus today. People got mad at Jesus then. People get mad at Jesus today. We get mad at Jesus when he doesn't do what we want him to do. When he doesn't say what we want him to say. When he's not politically correct or, or, or whatever. When he doesn't act like we want him to act. And, and doesn't approve or affirm us when we think or believe or do or say or act in ways he doesn't approve of. Ways we would prefer. Again, that makes us no different from the people of Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. In many ways, their worldly desires, the earthly things they wanted, had so blinded them to the, to the scriptures and the true purpose of the Messiah. He had come to save them, but they didn't even understand what salvation was what he would save them from and the way he would go about that salvation was not anything like they had in mind. See, I, I think the same thing blinds us too today. The worldly, earthly, fleeting things of life we want so much have blinded us to who Jesus is, what the Bible says, what Jesus came to do what he wants from us in our lives. That brings me back to Palm Sunday number one, the day that marks the beginning of the most important week in human history. I'll say that again. Palm Sunday is the day that marks the most important day in human history, and let me tell you why. Well, let, let's go straight back to the little donkey to help me do that. Because the little donkey actually takes us straight to the point. Mark's version of this story, he says that this young donkey had never been ridden before. I don't know if y'all are very familiar with donkeys, horses, animals like that that you ride, but if you have one that's never been ridden, let me, let me tell you a little secret. It has to be broken you can ride. You can't just hop on one that's never been broken and expect to gallop off in the sunset. It doesn't work that way. The, the, the animal just will not cooperate. But this little donkey was different. This little donkey did cooperate. He, he was docile and, and calm and gentle. He, he even seemed to welcome and enjoy Jesus sitting on his back. And riding him for the first time ever. Little donkey remained calm when that great mass of people surrounded him. Everybody was yelling at the top of their lungs, Hosanna, waving all those tree limbs in his little face. 
you would have thought that the little donkey would have been so upset that it would have thrown Jesus off like a bucking bronco at a rodeo. But here's the thing. And I think it's a scandal to the people of Jerusalem that day. And I think it's a warning to us that dumb animals can recognize their maker even when intelligent, rational, and religious human beings refuse to. Remember and take to heart these words of the Lord in Isaiah 1, 3. The ox knows its owner and the donkey knows to whom it belongs and who cares for it. But Israel does not know me as Lord. My people do not understand. My people do not understand. They don't know who I am. They don't know what I came to do or how I came to do it. Even though they were shouting it out, they were pleading, they were begging as I rode into town that day. They were saying Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That's basically a quote, a direct quote from Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. It says, save us, Lord, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna, you see, means save us, Lord. The people that day cried out for salvation. But it was a very different kind of salvation. They weren't thinking of eternal salvation. They wanted earthly salvation. They wanted rescue, liberty from the Caesars and the Pharaohs of the world. They never gave a thought that their souls needed saving from sin, hell, and death. They were unconcerned about those things. It was only like this life was what mattered to them. But again, I think that's unfortunately the way it is for a lot of people today. But remember, Jesus said, what does it profit if you gain the whole world but lose your very soul? Back then, they didn't want to hear such high, lofty religious talk. Folks don't want to hear such talk today. Back then, they cared very little about their soul. I think that's true today, too. It's the world a lot of people really want. But Jesus didn't come to offer us the world. He came to offer us life. Life abundant, life eternal, life with him forever in heaven. That brings me to one more important point about Palm Sunday that we can't miss. One other significant aspect of uh, that, that they either couldn't wrap their heads around or just rejected outright. Is this. Palm Sunday was the beginning of Passover week. The great festival the Jews have to remember and celebrate the fact that a long time ago God sent Moses to rescue them from slavery in Egypt. The way they commemorated was this. You can look that up in Exodus 12 if you want to today. The Lord commanded them to select a lamb. A lamb without blemish, blemish on the tenth day of the first month. It was to live with the family for four days, and then on the fifth day, they were to sacrifice that lamb, smear the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their home so that the angel of death would pass over them and they would live. Ever since the time of Moses, Jews have celebrated the Passover in this way to remind them that God is the God of salvation. Which is why they were so worked up when Jesus came to town that day because many Jews of that time believed the Messiah would come during Passover and would deliver them from Rome. But here's where things take that unexpected turn. But I might add a very providential turn. That first Palm Sunday, hit this, was the tenth day of the first month. It was the day the sacrificial lamb was to be chosen and brought home. Friends, I hope you realize that it was no coincidence that Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, was chosen, was brought home that day just five days before he too would be sacrificed for us. 
The thought of all that was frankly more than the people of Jerusalem could bear. They wanted somebody who would take up a sword, not take up a cross and then be nailed to it. That's why they put so much stock in Jesus. Because if he truly was the Messiah, they believed that he could whip any army, any navy, any empire on the planet, maybe all of them combined. After all, that's why they yelled Hosanna at him when he rode that little donkey into town. It was because they were literally begging Jesus to save them by fighting their battles for them. Earthly battles. They were imploring Jesus to deliver them, to give them the victories they desired, even demanded, which is why he said, save us now. The saddest part of this story, though, I think, is this. They simply weren't looking for this, the kind of salvation Jesus came to bring. When they found out what he was bringing, they didn't want him. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted George Washington. They wanted Douglas MacArthur walking the shore in the Philippines. They wanted George Patton uh, storming into Italy. They wanted Dwight Eisenhower and D-Day. To put it in good old American cowboy terms, they wanted John Wayne riding into town on a great stallion, guns ablazing. Standing up to the bad guys and looking them straight in the eye and saying, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. And he would have driven the evildoers out of town or killed them dead where they stood in, in an old-fashioned duel on Main Street at high noon. They wanted John Wayne, but they got Mr. Rock, the guy who rode into towns on a little donkey instead of a great stallion. They wanted someone to fight their earthly battles. But Jesus came to fight the greatest battle of them all, to conquer sin and hell and death. And that's why they hated him. And also why so many people hate him today or ignore him or reject him or try to redefine him because he is not what they want him to be. Jesus, you see, comes on his terms, not ours. He comes humble and lowly, but as one who will also one day to whom uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He comes in the form of a servant, but also as the one who wants to be nothing more than the master of our lives. He comes as one bound for death. But the truth is, it is only through his death that any of us will ever have life. That's what was prophesied. That's what he taught. That's why he came. That's what he did. That's exactly what happened just five days later on that first Good Friday when St. Peter tells us Jesus Christ died for sins. Once for all, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the innocent for the guilty, so that he might bring us to God. 2,000 years ago, the Jews refused to accept a hero who would die. They rejected him because he would not do what they wanted. They hated him because he told them that it was only by his dying that they would ever be set free. Only by his death that they would ever have life. So the answer to the confirmation question I asked earlier, well, I guess it's pretty easy to see why they hated Jesus back then. But what's far more difficult, what boggles my mind, what's hard to understand, is that knowing what we know, why do, still, why do people still hate him today? Why do they reject him today? Because we know, St. Peter went on to say, for we know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that we were redeemed, from this empty way of life handed down from our ancestors. Instead, we were redeemed. We were saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 
the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Let me say one more thing. Remember when I told you that in Luke's version of the story that Jesus, after he got off the donkey, just looked over the city and wept? Well, let me tell you why he wept. He wept back then because the people who should have known about him, who should have believed, didn't. They didn't understand him. And I believe that Jesus weeps today when we who should also know him don't believe don't understand. Whoever has ears, let them hear. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.